tell you were saying that John was with us in the big things and little things. I see people looking at their watches and wondering if we will be with the Cowboys today at three. We'll be out by then. This passage has been one of the most misused throughout modern history. It is only found in John. More about that later. It is very early in the gospel, just after John speaks of the eternal existence of Jesus. After John the Baptist is introduced to the story, and after the disciples are called. Over the years, there's been much ado about why Jesus and the disciples aren't at the wedding at all. Fulton Sheen, a Roman Catholic bishop who was very popular in the last century, he was a very popular radio and television evangelist, he thought that it was very likely that it was one of Mary's relatives who was getting married. Would be Mary and her relatives would be very embarrassed if they appeared inhospitable by running out of wine, giving Mary a reason to ask Jesus to intervene. She further suggests that as Jesus arrived with additional guests, they might just have contributed to the shortage. There were 13 of them, they were probably 13. Another pastor said it's simply a matter of etiquette. When Jesus and the disciples showed up, needed to bring something to the party. There are scholars who see this as a preview to the sacrament of communion. And since the onset of feminist theology, there are those who question why Jesus calls his mother woman. Then there are arguments about Jesus rebuking her and then doing exactly what she says. Others wonder why the huge jar used for purification would be empty. Well, jars had one purpose, was to hold water. For Jewish purification. Why should they be empty, especially during a wedding? Even if it was a huge wedding, empty purification vessels just don't make sense. Some call it a miracle. John calls it the first of seven signs of Jesus' divinity. And yet, even if it's a miracle, even if it's a sign, Jesus does what he does quietly, almost secretly, with only the servants and the disciples apparently knowing that it even happened. And you know, it's difficult to get your head around 120 to 180 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. And then moving from the sublime to the ridiculous. Justifying their drunkenness over the years, I've had, and this happened earlier in my ministry for the most part, inebriated people justify their state by saying, why Jesus was a bootlegger. We were intended to drink. Or was our favorite one. Bring your man. We're running out of hooch. I'm going to bring you some water, do you think? <laughs> and completely on the other side, there were those who totally abstained from alcohol, justifying what Jesus did at Cana, saying, Well, you know, this was not wise. It did not have time to permit. I have called it the gospel according to Welch, the great musical. <laughs> Back to the Bible itself. The changing of water into wine is what John calls the first of the seven signs of the divinity of Christ. Changing the water into wine, healing the royal official son, 
healing the paralyzed man at the side of, feeding the 5,000, walking on the water, healing the man born blind, and raising Lazarus. There are more, much more, many more in the synopsis. I think it's pretty accurate to say that there were 37 miracles in the gospel. Only three are common to all four Gospels. And the Gospels, I think it's helpful to understand now, uh, that Mark was written first. In fact, there was a proto-Gospel before he finished that Gospel, but probably came in final form about 65 AD. Matthew and Luke about 85 AD. And maybe John's Gospel between the beginning of the second century in 110 AD. Each of the Gospels reports the events of Jesus, uh, reports his life from a different perspective <coughs> with different emphases, much as witnesses in our time would see and understand through totally different eyes and with different as they interview all the people that were in the sanctuary in Collinsville yesterday in the synagogue, they would get a ton of different perspectives. <clears throat> Mark's gospel began with what? With John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. <laughs> Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus, the story of the Magi, and the trip to Egypt. Luke contains the events in and around the Christmas story and the story of Jesus and the young, young lad. John begins with the cosmic eternal existence of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The introduction of John the Baptist and the calling of the disciples, and then today's passage in John 2, the marriage of Cain. So we have come full circle. What in the world was going on with this marriage in Canaan? Why did John in his gospel, in his gospel, find it so significant? John was written from a different perspective at a much later time, while the other three gospels dealt primarily with what had happened to what did Jesus what did he do? John wrote his gospel much later as an old man. He had had probably 60 or so years after Jesus' ministry to reflect on it. So not only did John report what happened from his perspective, he reported what he thought that these events meant. Jesus went to a wedding in Canaan about four miles from the family home in Nazareth. He was already there. He just called Nazareth, called Nathaniel, who lived there. So it was a short hike. Made perfect sense for him to be there. What John saw and recorded for history was what? The extravagance of God's love. How big were those buckets? Huge. All those reading this gospel then and now should take from this act, whatever else they take from this act, just how extravagant God's love is. It could have just started with a young Jesus saving a friend of his mother from embarrassment and disgrace at this important time. We've come full circle again. We began the sermon with a lot of crazy thoughts and emphases on why the eternal truth is just really isn't about why. Goes way beyond that. It's analogous to the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal father. We would think that that was the eternal truth there. 
is not about what the menu was at the barbecue, but about the enormous love of God. <coughs> For instance, because of your generosity to Dave's life, this week we helped a lot of people. We helped a family head toward Oregon where a family member was very sick and they needed some help. It didn't matter whether we got them gasoline or a diesel or put them up in a motel or bought them a ticket. The deal is they were helped. Y'all were generous. We were able to work that out. A number of families this week need food. The issue is not what did we feed them, but that they were fed. Christianity and the Christian church should be filled with joy and laughter and love. This is a church that loves each other and helps each other and knows how to enjoy each other. Wherever Jesus went, he celebrated people. Whether it was people at a wedding feast in Cana, people being healed, people sharing a meal together. He carried a spirit of celebration as he proclaimed a God of love and joy. The joyous wedding feast at Cana is still a sign to us, the church today, to rejoice. David Steele was a Presbyterian minister and author, and he called this spirit of celebration, Cana love. It's about the knack of making people feel welcome, a sense of well-being, a sense of love. So finally in your life, my life, the lives of those you encounter, what is in short supply? What is it you've run out of? What are those areas? What can be done about them? When I was a very, very young student pastor, there was a young junior high girl in the church in Seagrave, Texas. Her name was Tootie. I don't know her name really was, but everybody called her Tootie. And as the group was studying this passage, said, um, what's this all about? And so he said, Richard Jim, it means you ain't seen nothing yet. <clears throat> How true. Are you running on empty trust in Jesus? Are your tanks full 